identify the sinus A. This paranasal sinus is located between the orbit and the nose, and it is the ethmoidal air sinus or ethmoidal air cells. The other paranasal sinuses which are shown here are the frontal and the maxillary. And then identify the bone here. The bone, this is the inferior concha and the lateral wall of the nose. It's a separate bone of the skull by itself. The questions here are about the muscles used by these kids to kiss or to pout. First of all, let's identify these muscles. Some of these muscles, like muscle 1, 4, 3, and, and 5, are muscles of facial expression. It's only 2 is the masseter muscle. It's a muscle of mastication. These muscles of facial expression, they form a sphincter and a dilator mechanism around the mouth. The sphincter mechanism is formed by muscle 4, which is the orbicularis oris muscle. It lies within the lips and encircles the mouth and is inserted into the mucous membrane of the lips. Its tone closes the lips and more powerfully it protrudes them as in whistling or in kissing like in the baby shown in A. So for A it's for orbicularis oris. The other muscles shown here are one is the zygomaticus major, it's part of the dilator mechanism and is used in smiling. Three is buccinator, is the muscle of the cheek that's used in sucking. And five is depressor anguli oris. Depressor labia inferioris is located just medial to it here. But five is depressor anguli oris. It arises from the anterolateral base of the mandible and as the name indicates, it depresses the angle of the mouth, the depressor anguli oris, and is the muscle responsible for the pouting in baby shown in picture B. This foramen is viewed from the posterior aspect of the skull. You can see here part of foramen magnum. This is the condylar process, and here is the mastoid process, and so the Foramen is located just behind the mastoid process and the temporal bone and it's called the mastoid emissary foramen. This foramen is not always present. It might be present unilaterally or bilaterally. Sometimes multiple foramina might be present and it transmits an emissary vein. Emissary veins connect the veins of the scalp with dural venous sinuses inside the skull and of course they are obviously a possible route for the spread of infection from the scalp veins into the sinuses of the skull it communicates between posterior auricular vein which is located behind the auricle and the transverse venous sinus identify the branches a to e these are the branches of the facial nerve the sole motor supply to the muscles of facial expression. The facial nerve as it arises from the stylomastoid foramen finds itself in the substance of the parotid gland. Here you can see this is the parotid gland and the nerve is present within the gland. It divides into a mesh of intercommunicating branches that lie in a plane superficial to the vein and to the artery. The vein is the retromandibular vein and the artery is the external carotid artery. All are embedded in the gland, but the most superficial is the facial nerve and its branches. And then, finally, five branches emerge from the anterior border of the gland. Some of them may be duplicated. That's why we talk about groups of branches. And the branches here are A, temporal, B, zygomatic, C, buccal, D, marginal mandibular, and E is the cervical branch that supplies the platysma muscle. The duct that is located here, accompanying the buccal branches of the facial nerve, extends from the anterior border of the parotid gland. It's the parotid duct. It opens against the second upper molar tooth in the vestibule of the mouth. What is the distal attachment of this muscle, A? Now the muscle is located in the posterior triangle of the neck. The posterior triangle is located posterior to sternocleidomastoid muscle, located between sternocleidomastoid 
and trapezius muscle and in the posterior triangle you can see in the floor these whitish structures they are parts of the brachial plexus here you can see the trunks of the brachial plexus and of course the trunks come from the roots are the continuation of the roots anterior to the brachial plexus the muscle is a scalenus anterior muscle and posterior to it is a scalenus medius muscle so a is the scalenus anterior muscle the muscle distally it is attached to the first strip to the superior surface of the first strip there is a tubercle on its medial border it's called the scalene tubercle to which scalenus anterior muscle is attached in front of scalenus anterior and related to the superior surface of the first strip is the subclavian vein and behind the scalenus anterior and again related to the superior surface of the first strip is the subclavian artery and the inferior trunk of the brachial plexus muscle b as we mentioned previously is the trapezius muscle you can see part of the muscle here is attached to the clavicle and to the acromion process of the scapula as well these are the superior fibers of trapezius that uh, elevate or shrug the shoulder and the muscle is supplied by the accessory nerve the spinal root of the accessory nerve which also supplies sternocleidomastoid muscle what is the most likely site of fracture that would result in paralysis of muscles of mastication first let's identify the structures here this is a um, an axial CT of the skull showing here foramen ovale, the oval foramen within the sphenoid bone, and behind it is the foramen spinosum. Here is the petrous part of the temporal bone, and at the apex of the petrous part of the temporal bone is the foramen lacerum. Within the petrous temporal bone is the carotid canal, and behind this foramen is the jugular foramen. So the fracture that will result in paralysis of the muscles of mastication would involve the nerve, the motor innervation of these muscles, and this is provided by the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. The mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve passes through foramen ovale. So the fracture here at A might result in paralysis of muscles of mastication on the same site. B allows the passage of nervous spinosis, which is sensory for the meninges of the middle cranial fossa c foramen lacerum is actually closed in life and it might allow the passage of some emissary veins but not nerves or arteries carotid canal allows the passage of the internal carotid artery surrounded by the plexus of sympathetic nerves and the jugular foramen allows the passage of cranial nerves 9 glossopharyngeal 10 vagus and 11 the accessory nerve and these are not involved with the nerve supply of the muscles of mastication identify the muscle a list two of its functions the muscle is masseter it's a muscle of mastication it consists of two parts superficial and deep parts it originates from the zygomatic arch and is attached to the lateral side of the angle and ramus of the mandible the superficial head is the larger part of the muscle which we can see here and its fibers pass downwards and posteriorly the deep head is much smaller and its fibers pass downwards and forwards it actually arises from the medial aspect of the zygomatic arch most of its fibers are concealed by the superficial head the action of the muscle during bilateral contraction is to elevate the mandible obviously the superficial fibers can also protrude the mandible Name one muscle supplied by A and name the cutaneous branch of B. So this is a dissection of the infratemporal fossa. You can see here that the mandible has been cut at the angle. Ramus of the mandible is removed. Here is the remaining part of the condyle of the mandible. And we can see inside the infratemporal fossa the lateral pterygoid muscle, medial pterygoid muscle. On the surface of medial pterygoid, we can see the lingual nerve anteriorly. And then this is the inferior alveolar nerve. 
you can see here that the inferior alveolar nerve disappears in the bone because it passes through the mandibular foramen and before doing so it gives the nerve to mylohyoid which does not pass through the mandibular foramen but passes behind the lingula in a groove of bone and descends down into the submental triangle so this nerve a is motor to two muscles the mylohyoid as its name indicates and the anterior belly of digastric muscle remember that the posterior belly of digastric is supplied by the facial nerve together with the stylohyoid muscle b the inferior alveolar nerve itself is purely sensory it supplies the mandibular teeth and gives a branch the mental nerve that leaves the mandible through the mental foramen to supply the skin of the chin and lower lip and this is the cutaneous branch of the inferior alveolar nerve the mental nerve identify the structures a and b this is a dissection of the anterior triangle of the neck the sternocleidomastoid has been cut and we can see the the structures that are located in and around the carotid sheath so this is the common carotid artery and the external carotid internal carotid the first anterior branch of the external carotid artery is the superior thyroid artery a we can follow it down to the thyroid gland this is the thyroid gland one of the lobes of the thyroid gland so a is the superior thyroid artery and b is a nerve actually it's a loop of nerves is located outside the carotid sheath and this loop of nerves is derived from the cervical plexus and it supplies uh, some of the infrahyoid muscles including the sternothyroid uh, sternohyoid and omohyoid muscles is derived from a superior root of ansa cervicalis from c1 that accompanies the hypoglossal nerve this is the hypoglossal nerve the fibers hitchhike with the hypoglossal nerve and then leave the hypoglossal nerve as the superior root of the ansa cervicalis from c1 and the inferior root of ansa cervicalis from c2 and 3 and they form this loop or ANSA, which means loop, that supplies the, these three infrahyoid muscles.